All right, today we are going to be talking about the last four artists for our um, discussion-based assessment. Frank Lloyd Wright is exam. the next artist we're going to talk about. Let me go back um, here. Remember, cool. there is oh. also a uh, last make day. Frank Lloyd Wright was an American architect born in Wisconsin on June 8, 1867. Uh, through his out, uh, lifetime, he was an architect, interior designer, in writer, and teacher. Uh, and his younger, when he was younger, he was inspired his, by his mother to follow his dreams. Um, one of the things you should know about him that's probably going to be asked about is how he got uh, his interest in starting as a child. He started working with uh, uh, building blocks. DBA. Let's go back here. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was an American architect born in Wisconsin uh, in, in 1867. Uh, he was an architect, interior designer, writer, and teacher. Uh, it's important to know that he did a, most of his work in the early 1900s, uh, 1920s, 30s, um, 40s, uh, in that, that time period. Uh, he was inspired by his mom to follow his dreams. Um, he had blocks. He played uh, with building blocks that things. you likely he had as a child as well. Uh, uh, he started the Prairie School of uh, Design. Those types of houses have those overhanging eaves. Edges of the roof stick out past the edge of the building, like you see in the white building in the middle. Uh, they're grouped in long. They're often grouped in long windows. horizontal bands. The windows are, if you look was, at that uh, a uh, little streak of light uh, in the, in the window on the left, or those bands of windows going horizontally in the building on the right. A uh, big open. The Four movement was a reaction to houses that were built in a up that space inside. Uh, often made out of natural materials, and that was to kind of help them blend in with their surroundings. And, and as you can see, these are a couple of examples, and um, they they uh, often even made uh, use of like uh, the materials that were local to that area. Place. But they tried to make the homes blend in. With he was king his of right, bringing the outside uh, unique style developed. He became inspired this, by nature uh, more and more. This is one of the homes he created called uh, Falling Water. Uh, this is we'll I'll talk uh, we'll a little bit ask, uh, ask you a little bit about Falling Water. Uh, this design um, that makes use of a river that literally runs through the home. Um, uh, it's a beautiful home, home but it like uh, often has space. some now, architectural was, uh, issues with it, uh, as well as having a bunch of water come to the home uh, all the time. Uh, Talisman West was so built in 1937. This was uh, the space that he used the, uh, as a training center, really, uh, for architects and uh, uh, apprentices who came to study with him. This is that, that was that architectural home. Uh, that he, he started making these Usonian homes after he was challenged to make a home that only cost uh, he built $5,000. But even homes, in the very the 5, inexpensive homes, and you see an example of one on the left, uh, he yeah, designed he everything to down to the furniture. Same elegant homes. lines and all the same uh, great features. Uh, he was famous for making, uh, designing the furniture, um, particularly these, these chairs, lines, uh, chairs uh, which made uh, use of these elongated rectangles very often. He was obsessed with these geometric shapes. Plates, dishes, the silverware sometimes even and we specifically looked at the the way that uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright or, made uh, use uh, of stained glass and designed uh, the stained glass in the homes that he created uh, and um, he designed those uh, specifically to go with his architecture that he was designed of the home those windows were uh, uh, almost a, a, a parallel reflection and when I say parallel reflection I mean literally the line Frank Stella the next artist is the next that we studied was Frank Stella, uh, was American, artist born, American artist, artist born in Massachusetts in 1936. Again, uh, one of the things that I'd like for you to know about him is so uh, he was and uh, learned from his father, who was a painter. Uh, he was a house painter, so he really became obsessed with these uh, um, he learned uh, about lots common of, uh, tools that, that normal was, uh, artists and regular people had to use. And um, when he painted, he often painted in enamel uh, paints, which are not a and, uh, kind of... Which is kind of what made him a little different than a lot of other artists. Uh, his uh, unique uh, style changed over time. Uh, he experimented with new styles. Uh, he was attracted to some of those uh, kind of off the wall artists, uh, uh, de Kooning, Klein. Um, but he wasn't just wanting to create abstract. Kind of hoped he would. He started looking for new ways new, uh, uh, way to express himself through his paintings. And, and so, to find his style, he started uh, practicing paint really by painting over. Uh, uh, he early with. on focused on those simple geometric. When he worked on uh, the black paintings, this series, um, where he focused gray, just on. Uh, when he started using color, we see those 
primary and secondary. He started experimenting with color uh, and that same type of uh, uh, basic uh, use of shape that he had been using in the black the series, the black painting series. Uh, but now he started introducing color, started looking at how color could control the movement of the eye in a work of art. Um, he had that protractor series. He continued to use uh, <laughs> these, uh, these, these shapes, shapes uh, these the basic and uh, colors and shapes, the primary and secondary and colors, the, uh, the circles, triangles, and... Um, Often using those bright colors. In his later work, as he Stella removed later, the canvas all together. And, and all we sort together, of did with this with our really uh, second uh, piece on the make uh, day, uh, uh, where we started looking really at the freedom of creating lines and shapes and colors in any way you really wanted, wanted to go. Bold, things got very bold, wild. Uh, again, uh, but though, the, primary, again, he, he used pattern and repetition and some of those things to help create and some that. That and unity. See, uh, he goes uh, that but by using uh, so maximum, many elements, he, had the uh, he developed this style that, that became known as maximalism. To the maximum. Now we got lots of crazy movement and all kinds of cool stuff. And then he uh, sort of finishes up his styles with this. Uh, I don't want to say finishes up. He works later in this. But we, what we looked at, he finished up sort of with this layered layered works of art where he's got patterns layered over top of one another. His work changed. Um, the attendance very, very answer question kind of is a recycle to today. It's Claude Monet. He was uh, a key Claude figure Monet, in the Impressionist uh, movement. Oh, that's not their attendance answer. Uh, David Hockney, excuse me, is the next. Uh, and Claude Monet is not our attendance answer this week. Uh, <laughs> I popped him out of space from last week. Uh, David Hockney is an English painter born on July 9th, 1937 in Bradford, England. Uh, to pursue his passion for art, Hockney attended the Bradford Art School. Uh, most I want you to understand that he again worked in those, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. They were looking at artists that sort of worked at the end of the 1900s. Uh, inspired by Cubist, you'll remember he made those really cool uh, Cubist inspired photo collages where he would take lots of different pictures and use those geometric shapes uh, to assemble and, and collage together to create one image. Uh, you'll remember that we kind of looked at how Hockney's work compared to the Cubist here. He's breaking those little uh, spaces down to those cubes and those little um, broken down parts. This is <laughs> that uh, painting of um, uh, the Grand Canyon. When he goes into the color and starts creating those abstract uh, paintings, those bright, colorful abstract paintings, uh, we see that uh, he starts by doing so by breaking those down into those little sections like he did in the collages. When he starts working in that abstract um, uh, style with all this beautiful color, broad, uh, bright color, <clears throat> we see a subject matter becomes those landscapes, very often those trees reaching up. We see his uh, use of line uh, was very much emphasized. We see it emphasized in those trees going up, uh, creating those uh, horizontal lines. We see the vertical lines being created by those, um, the pool in that top line or the uh, horizon line in the bottom left. We see lots of line being used in the uh, the works on the right as well. Again, we look at the use of color. It was abstracted. Uh, primary and secondary colors is what he used in those <coughs> in those big works. You're going to want to know that he was that English painter born in 37 and worked again in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, used bright colors <coughs> in his paintings when he didn't do those um, photo collages. Bridget Riley is the op artist we studied. She did that um, optical illusion art. Op art means optical illusion art. Um, when we look at her work again, she was born uh, in 31. So she's working again in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And um, uh, she starts off with these sort of black and white, again, monochromatic. Uh, works creating these illusions where we see things uh, creating movement or space where none really exists. But she does start to work with color. And when she does, again, we see uh, some of that primary and secondary color. But what's really neat is that she creates all these very concise, precise, and very uh, well orchestrated um, elements within her pieces. She does so without using any tools whatsoever. She does everything by hand. Uh, no measuring uh, tools and that sort of thing. She transfers, uh, her, she does these big, uh, she's what we call a process painter. She does these big gouache paintings and then transfer those <coughs> onto uh, these spaces where she then goes over them with acrylic paint. Uh, she then takes uh, oil paint over the acrylic paint. And she does this process painting, this layering, you know, one uh, medium over the other. And again, does all that without the use of any really fancy measuring tools. 
You should know that she worked in the 60s, 70s, 80s. She was one of the leading op artists. You should know that op art seeks to trick the brain. It's about that optical illusion. And she didn't use any tools to create her fancy stuff. Salvador Dali, last but not least. Salvador Dali was that weirdo. He did all of those surrealistic paintings. Remember the word surrealistic. Uh, this surrealistic style or surrealist style uh, was all about being super realistic to the point that it became beyond real and take on those dreamlike qualities, dreamlike qualities. I'll say it again, dreamlike qualities. They were trying to touch those surrealists, trying to touch our subconscious, trying to get into what was our brain thinking when we weren't thinking about what we were thinking about. <laughs> what was our brain doing when we weren't uh, uh, paying attention? And they would do so by writing their thoughts down in the stream of conscious. They would create notebooks and allow that stream of conscious to express itself. So they would write about our dreams and that sort of thing and then create these wild, cool, crazy um surrealistic paintings so what makes them surreal surrealistic paintings use um, a lot of um, displacement things where they shouldn't be um, where you see lots of distortion or abstraction um, where those um, things are um, twisted or elongated or abstract colors are being used or for instance the top of his head is sort of cut off here on the top right but yet we see it's created again with this woman in the eyes. <laughs> so that's using displacement. The woman shouldn't be there. But also abstraction. The mustache is really stretched out and that sort of thing. We look at animals. There's lots of animals used. That sort of thing. Um, again, the most important thing is that dreamlike qualities used. Uh, think about how you can use that word over and over again. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Dolly sought to create unity even as he worked with these very strange elements that often thought like that they should maybe uh, look like they didn't belong together. He created that unity often by how he used those uh, elements of art. Uh, the color is very consistent. When we look at how he's used color here, texture, uh, we talked about the feathers on the right, how he used sort of a consistent texture and the way he handled the color. They have a unified look, even the piece on the left. All of the sky, all of the eyeball, the little weird water thing that's been reflected into. And even the uh, the ground around it is all sort of handled in the same um, values, the same um, um, sort of shade, if you will, of, uh, of color and, and or at least the same value, I should say, of color. Uh, or hue and so even there's no real bright colors there's no heavily saturated everything's about sort of the same very even creates that unity uh, last but not least you just want to take a look at how they use displacement and again some abstraction we see these weird anamorphic type creatures being used on the right hand side uh, there's abstraction where we got displacement and weird things of fire the animals legs are a little longer than they might be and they're abstracted the way that they look like they're made of human flesh almost as opposed to giraffe skin. On the left, we see displacement where the upside down butterfly is, but also abstraction where we've got weird things going on. There's an arm coming out from underneath that owl's uh, wing. Uh, again, displacement being used in the middle where we've got butterflies instead of um, uh, the sails. Uh, the last thing you should know about Dolly is he worked with Disney to create that film, Destino. Destino is that uh, that film that looked at how they combined the um, sort of universal and mainstream uh, animation that Disney had come up with, with this very uh, non-mainstream, outside-the-box, uh, um, let's just call it strange, surrealistic, dreamlike qualities that... Uh, um, Dolly brought uh, to the film. So the two of them kind of worked together and collaborated and created that really strange film Disney and Dolly. You should know that he was the most famous surrealist Dolly was in the surreal movement. The most famous. Known for his abstracted animals, unusual environments and displacement. Things where they don't belong. And he worked with Disney to create Destino. And you need an attendance answer. The last one of the year R2D2. He's my uh, favorite Star Wars character. If you pay attention, you recognize that all of the Jedi and all of the other characters would all be dead long ago if it weren't for R2-D2. 
Uh, he saves everybody's life. Uh, early on, there wouldn't have been a, a Darth Vader if it had been for R2-D2. There wouldn't have been any of the uh, Luke Skywalker. Uh, no, uh, Leah. Nobody. If it had been for R2-D2. Uh, nobody would have been a Jedi ever again. Pay attention watch the movies. He's the real hero. Guys, uh, I look forward to seeing what kind of art you create. I also look forward to seeing you next week. We're going to be doing our discussion-based assessment all next week. Uh, you can come essentially between 9 a.m. And, um, and 12 on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. This is our last discussion-based assessment. Please make sure you come. Don't wait until noon on Friday. And um, please make sure you watch uh, uh, this entire review before you come for your discussion-based assessment. All right. I look forward to seeing you. Have a great day and enjoy uh, your break.